When Aquinas starts to talk about the mystery of the Holy Trinity, he asks a very interesting question. He says, is there procession in the life of God? Well, that's a funny sort of question. What he means by that is not like a liturgical procession, but something like an emanation. Uh, and he's talking about the eternal generation of the Word and the eternal spiration of the Holy Spirit as processions in God. Well, he asks it as a question because, of course, it's not obvious to human reason, philosophically speaking, that there is such a thing. But as he notes, the New Testament reveals and claims that it is the case that God is teaching us that there is procession in the life of God, that in God there is the eternal generation of the Word, immaterial generation of the Logos in Greek, uh, the reason or wisdom of the Father, and there's the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. And Aquinas is trying to understand that, so when he asks the question, is there procession in the life of God, he's trying to think about the analogies we could draw from our own human experience to talk about what's going on in the mystery of God who is eternal and one. Now, of course, Aquinas presupposes that God is one, as the scriptures teach, and he is a monotheist, as are all Christians. So, how do we think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the procession of the Word and the procession of the Spirit in the life of God? Now, when he goes to analyze the mystery of the Father, he talks about the Father being first in the life of the Trinity uh, because the Father is, as he says, a principle without a principle. He is the one from whom the Word and the Spirit are derived eternally. Now, when he talks about the eternal derivation of the Word and the Spirit, the eternal life of the Son and of the, the Holy Spirit, he is talking about them as um, derived from the Father by procession, and that procession can be understood in two ways, as an eternal generation of the Word or an eternal spiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, Aquinas needs to develop an analogy to make it clear that he's not talking about, you might say, a physical process, a biological process, a material reality. So, when we talk about procession in the life of God, we don't want to say there's something like human generation or a physical begetting or material change, because God's wholly immaterial, perfect actuality, in a way eternal and immutable that is unfathomable to us, but God is absolutely perfect. So the Father is not undergoing some kind of physical process, that's not what we're talking about. So the closest analogy we do have from ourselves, presupposing a kind of Aristotelian analysis of the human person, is that we beget or we conceive concepts spiritual thoughts, intellectual ideas, which are not merely imaginations or sensible representations, but universal immaterial concepts. And we voluntarily choose and will and love in ourselves through free acts of the human will. So there's something like an image of the Trinity in each human being. We are ourselves the progenitors of immaterial thought and the progenitors of immaterial willing and loving. This is the Imago Dei in us, the image of God. So when Aquinas goes to analyze the mystery of the Father, he says the Father is in a certain way uh, conceived under the analogy to a human being as the principle without a principle, he from whom the Word eternally uh, is derived as the begotten wisdom of the Father and from whom the Spirit proceeds as the spirated love of the Father. So just as a human being can immaterially know themselves through thinking and can immaterially love themselves through willing and rightly love themselves, not in an egoistic way, but in a good way, so we can think about God eternally knowing and loving himself and eternally begetting the Word as his begotten wisdom and the Spirit as his spirated love. So the Father here is conceived not as, you might say, the originator of uh, human life or physical things, but, or even the Father of the creation. It's really thinking about the Father eternally in the life of God being the eternal spiritual immaterial generator of the eternal immaterial Word and the eternal immaterial Spirit, so that we understand that the mystery of the Trinitarian life is a life of communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of the Father, the Word, and the spirated love. And what is true of us in a um, more imperfect way is true of God in a most perfect way. So, two analogies here. In us, uh, three persons can be in communion by knowledge and love, but they aren't one in being. 
So three people could have the same deep idea, the same profound communion of love, but they aren't the same individual. In God, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a communion of knowledge and love that are three persons, one in being. The Father eternally begets the Son as personally distinct, but, one, but communicates to Him the whole of His being, the whole of the divine life. The Son has in Himself all that is in the Father and is truly God and the one God. And the Spirit is the love of the Father and the Son, who receives from the Father and the Son the fullness of divine life and is Himself eternally the one God. So the communion of persons in God is like three human persons, but in, incomprehensibly more perfect and more beautiful and in a certain way uh, unfathomable. And the other analogy would be to a human single person, like an individual, you know, you and I can have thoughts and we can love, and so in a certain way this is an analogy to the Holy Trinity, just as the Father has wisdom and love that proceeds from Him, so the human being can have wisdom and love that proceed from them. But in us it's very imperfect because it's, you might say, merely accidental to our being. I mean, whether I'm in the act of knowing or the act of loving uh, is incidental or accidental to whether I exist. So <clears throat> if I'm asleep, I am able to be knowing and loving, and maybe I'm even knowing and loving something a little bit in the phantasms of a dream that's you know noble or whatever, but mm, I'm not really ex exerting personhood in a very deep way. We're very modest in the way that we're thinking or willing in, at certain times, especially even just in our ordinary animal life when we're sensing or remembering or feeling. So in God, however, the begetting of the eternal wisdom is the begetting of the whole substance of the divine life. So everything that's in the Father is begotten in the Son, and everything that's in the Father and the Son is spirated in the Holy Spirit. So there's no accidentality, there's no uh, potentiality, there's no possibility of being or not being, there's no, you might say, ontological frailty. There's rather eternal immutable perfection wherein the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always the one God in whom each is present, the perfect actuation of the divine essence, the fullness of divine life is present in each of the three persons. So that means that God in His, you might say, in His, in, if we take the analogy of oneness of person, He's really wholly unlike us in many ways, even though there is a faint resemblance to how He's like us. And if we think about three persons in communion, He's very much unlike the three persons in communion, even though he's also like three persons in communion. So there's a kind of a Trinitarian analogy to a single person, a Trinitarian analogy to three persons. They're mutually corrective. Uh, but the Father in the divine life is the origin of the Son and Spirit and communicates the fullness of Trinitarian life to each of them.